resiliency project uh, within the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Karen uh, Rivich. Did I get that right, Karen? Yes. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, a man whose column in USA Today over the last uh, near decade, uh, home front, uh, has covered the impacts of these wars <coughs> on soldiers and families who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan and around the world and for whom we're uh, very beholding for being here, uh, Mr. Greg Zoroya. As a way of setting the stage for today's uh, panel discussion or and in preparation of uh, individual perspectives from our panel members on resilience, it's links to readiness, to individual readiness, and the Army's Ready and Resilient Campaign, or R2C, uh, allow me just to give a short personal uh, perspective of the background of, of this uh, exciting area. My experience and knowledge of the roots of the Army's and the entire U.S. military's interest in resilience began for me on active duty in the mid-90s when the then Chief Staff of the Army, uh, now uh, former, uh, excuse me, Secretary uh, Eric Shinseki, began a dialogue among the senior leadership of the Army about what were then known as quality of life programs and how they contributed to the readiness of the force. Um, he was interested in the well-being of the Army family writ large, that is, its soldiers, families, civilians, retirees, and their families. <clears throat> as an Army War College student in 1999, I was privileged to serve on General Shinseki's uh, uh, Army well-being study, which was intended to explore a much more multi-dimensional construct for these and other programs. Can't move the podium. I hope the sound people are working this. Intended to explore a much more multi-dimensional construct for these and other programs which faced constant budgetary challenges and problems with the assessment of their impacts. But it really wasn't until OEF and OIF that uh, General George Casey, then the Chief of Staff, began to challenge the medical personnel, installation management chaplain, and other communities to provide him with a much more complete understanding of how we were focusing not only on how we cared for soldiers and their families who encountered problems with psychological, physical, spiritual, and other issues that included hospitalizations for mental <coughs> health, DUIs, of uh, spiritual issues, um, alcohol and drug addictions, family and soldier violence, but he challenged us on, uh, to know what we were doing to prevent these problems from occurring in the first place. Uh, and what were we doing to build resilience in an active way? In a series of very revealing meetings with the chief and the vice chief, which my staff and my counterparts at that time uh, of, of the panel that are here today, it was apparent that although we struggled with the timeliness and the coordination of services to re remedy problems once they were manifest, we did not fully understand and we were woefully lacking in our programs to keep people out of the danger zone, to actively prevent these issues from emerging in the first place and to foster self-care. What was equally apparent to me and the chief and my fellow Army staff leaders was that this was not a medical issue. It rightfully belonged to Army leaders, to officers, NCOs, civilian leaders. This became then the genesis of the Comprehensive Soldier Fitness Program, which is now the Comprehensive Soldier and Family Fitness Program, and an integral part of the R2C campaign that was begun by then Brigadier General Rhonda Cornham under the auspices of the Army 357, not the medical community, but the, the, the line leadership. The program began uh, a multi-dimensional model of the determinants of personal well-being and resilience, physical, emotional, spiritual, family, and social. The Army partnered with Dr. Dr. Martin um, Sel Seligman and the University of Pennsylvania's Positive Psychology Center to build tools for evaluating well-being and resilience and programs to strengthen these important attributes. DOD and Joint Staff then followed with a template uh, for what is called the Total Force Fitness Initiative under then Chairman Admiral Mike Mullen. Now resilience in this context is defined as, and I'm quoting here from the Army website, the mental, physical, emotional, and behavioral ability to face and cope with adversity, to adapt to change, to recover, to learn, and grow from setbacks, end quote. Well, it's often described in mechanical references to a spring or a tennis ball which encounters 
uh, a stress and then rebounds to its original shape, human res resilience actually goes beyond this, not only adapting to and overcoming the present adversity, but strengthening in the process, ready to encounter different and even greater challenges, a phenomenon which some call thriving. As you'll learn today, while there is much to learn about what contributes to one's resilience and much is, much is already known. I'm looking really forward to Dr. Rybich's comments and discussion. I also hope to learn more about what a profound cultural change this has required within the Army and continues <coughs> to, uh, to undergo uh, under the oversight, support, and guidance of the top leadership of the Army. All are partnered in this effort, and I'm eager to explore these interconnections uh, between the oversight by the Vice Chief and the Army G1 and the support that's offered at each camp, post, and station by the Installation Management Command, the Medical Command, and many others. Finally, uh, for, for what I believe is the only time during this year's AUSA meeting, uh, we've invited a passionate spokesperson for and translator of the public's perception of difficulties which soldiers and their family members face after a dozen years of armed conflict. Mr. Greg Zoroya is here uh, to provide that unvarnished perspective for which we're very appreciative. And with that, I'm going to turn uh, the microphone over to, our, to the 34th Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, General John Campbell, a man who's commanded, led uh, soldiers in combat uh, in a variety of the Army's uh, branches and communities to include special operations, uh, light infantry, uh, both in the 25th and the 82nd, has uh, been mentored by uh, the most senior leaders and uh, has even done a stint in academics at uh, UC Davis. And with that, Vice, your comments, please. Thanks, Eric. Well, first off, thanks, everybody, for taking the time to be here. If you think we can see you in the back, we can't. Those lights are positioned just right so that it's blinding us, and we're going to focus on the notes here. Let, let me give you a little bit different ROE. For me, this is a, uh, a great opportunity uh, to get a great, great panel in the leadership here of the Army to talk about Reading Resilience. And we could sit here and talk about the things that we're doing and the programs that are tied into it, and we'll do a little bit of that. And what I'm going to encourage the panel to do is, at least for the uniform folks here, keep your remarks short. All right? And what will be better for us, and I think you'll get more out of, is the dialogue and the conversation and your questions. You also, and I can see a little bit, have some senior leaders in uniform, Mike Tucker, First Army Commander, who was uh, instrumental as a Deputy G3 when I was a G3 to help get this moving. Uh, Ken Riddle in the back that leads Comprehensive Soldier Family Fitness. Uh, others in here that have seen or been to post cancer stations that have great ideas. I'd encourage the other commanders, command sergeant majors, and soldiers, if you've seen something out there as a question comes up uh, and you can add to whatever we put into that, please add that, all right? Because at the end of this, what we want everybody to come away with is a better appreciation of where the Army is trying to move with Ready and Resilient Campaign and how it is going to take a culture change for our Army to move in that direction. So that's, that's really uh, the ROE. This has sort of been an RTEP day. So if, you, if you're older than, you've been in the Army since after 2001, you don't know what I just said. But if you came in after, before 2001, RTEP means you've got a whole bunch of stuff out there, training, evaluation. Uh, for me, it started with the Cohen group this morning. I spoke to them. I just left the Sergeant Major of the Army's luncheon where I had the opportunity to talk to all the non-commissioned officers, Sergeants Majors, and my focus in that presentation was about ready and resilience. It was about how important it is to our Army and how we need our non-commissioned officers to take this on and to lead this cultural change within our Army. Because the general officers, we can talk about it from very high. The Secretary of the Army, he, he can talk about it. But till our non-commissioned officers grasp this and really take this on and own it, we won't get that culture change that we need. So that's really what I want to bring to that. But, you know, after more than a decade of fighting, both in Iraq and Afghanistan, really, as I think all of you know, the longest conflict that our nation has been involved in, we have to have the ability to rehabilitate, reset, and reshape the force. And uh, we have to do that not only for our Army and for this all-volunteer Army, but to get ready for the next fight. And we've learned some very valuable lessons over the last 12 years about resiliency. And so we have to take that and make sure we can synchronize and take the resources that we have and make sure we do what's best for our soldiers, our families, and our great civilians of the Department of Army. 
Bottom line is we can't ask our soldiers to do what's required of them and not recognize that it's our responsibility to prepare them and then provide the necessary support when that's required, especially after they've been in some of these situations. And we have a very small window, I believe, to take this on and start working on this culture change. So as Eric talked about, the Secretary of the Army launched a Ready and Resilience campaign in February of this year. And it really was about establishing culture change that integrates resilience and in how do we build, strengthen, maintain, and assess really our total fitness and our individual performance. And as Eric talked about, it ties into unit readiness. And that's really what it's about as we move forward. There's three different phases. phases. We're in phase one right now. Uh, there's some immediate actions that we're taking. We're taking a holistic look at all the different programs that are out there that come underneath the umbrella of Ready and Resilient Campaign. So as a vice chief, I try to get out on a health of the force trip. I've only been able to get out on one of those since I've been the, the vice since March. I did that about two months ago, and I went to four different posts. I picked a post at Picatinny Arsenal that was predominantly civilian, had about 97 percent civilians. Then I went to two force comp posts, Fort Campbell and Fort Drum, to see posts that we had soldiers that were deployed and continued to deploy and then talk to families that were there. And then I wanted to go to a TRADOC installation, and that was Fort Jackson, to see how we were dealing with the training force as we brought our new soldiers in. And the thing that I found out as I talked to soldiers, as I talked to program directors, as we talked to family members, is that everybody understood different pieces of Reading Resilient. They understood SHARP. They understood suicide prevention. They understood programs and how it tied into them. But they didn't really understand how the Army was really trying to take all those programs and build upon that and build some cultural change under Ready and Resilience. So we have to do a lot better. I'll head out next week and go to three more posts, Fort Riley, Fort Sill, and uh, JBLM Lewis, McCord. And again, kind of get the pulse of our soldiers, our family members, our great civilians, and really the program directors out there to see where we can do better. There's four different lines of effort for Ready and Resilience. I won't talk about those here. If it comes up in a question, I'll go in a little bit more detail. But again, really the piece for me as the vice that oversees this for our chief and our secretary, it's about executing this campaign and making sure that we understand the benefits that providing this resilience training, and it is, and the people I have talked to can be a game changer. But we have to make sure that we do this and continue to provide for our soldiers and families. The end state for the Ready and Resilient Campaign, and we'll know that as we continue to move, and I think this is a long, enduring campaign, is that the Army's culture has embraced resilience as part of our profession and as a key and critical component to our readiness. That leaders, soldiers, family members, and Army civilians receive quality assistance through coordinated efforts of all of our Army programs and our services really thus reinforcing the command climate of trust, mutual respect, and self-discipline. Also that our soldiers, when they enter the Army, we build them to become Army strong, they become stronger during their service, and then they transition as good members of society. The campaign efforts are incorporated into our Army campaign plan, the processes, the management activities. We'll talk a little bit about those as we go on today. But really, we have to produce a campaign plan and a product that endures change for this great institution. I'm going to look forward as we go on to the rest of the panel members. I'll have some other comments at the end, but there's two pieces that I have to bring up, and they really are an offshoot of Ready and Resilience, but I've been talking about them all day today, and so two points. One is you're going to hear a lot of things throughout the next couple of days, maybe even on this panel, about how woe things are out there, the budget constraints, even how it ties into Ready and Resilient campaign. But for all of our soldiers out there and our leaders, you're part of the best army in the world. It's the best manned, equipped, trained, and led army today. And we're going to have to make some very tough decisions, including in ready and resilience. And we're going to get smaller. But at the end of this transition, we're going to continue to be the best army, best manned, equipped, trained, and led army. And the last thing is we continue to be a nation at war. All right, if you live inside this beltway, you forget about that. I talked about it at lunch. I talked about it at breakfast. In the last four months, we've had 474 soldiers either wounded were killed in Afghanistan, 474. That's three plus rifle companies. That's almost a small battalion, all right? And hadn't even tweaked the news yet. And that's the last three months. And so we're going to continue to have that as we have men and women. And it's incumbent upon us as leaders, as members of society, to take care of these soldiers when they come back from those experiences. 
because they're doing incredible work and sacrificing for our nation. So I look forward to the rest of the panel. I look forward to taking your questions. But again, this will only be as good as the dialogue that we have this, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Vice. Uh, our next panelist to speak will be uh, the Army's 46th Deputy Chief of Staff uh, for G1, um, Lieutenant General Howard Romberg, a career uh, uh, air defender who has served around the world uh, in combat and uh, uh, Operation Desert Shield Storm and, uh, and uh, OEF and OIF and uh, has uh, served as uh, lead commander in a number of important installations. In fact, uh, I think we first met when you were at Fort Bliss and uh, was an incredible leader when it came to promoting the the uh, resilience and well-being of his installation. Uh, and General Romberg is going to speak uh, as the champion for these programs. And, and closely on to drive that change and I look forward to the dialogue today and please ask your questions because it's not an easy thing to get your head around you have to really really start thinking about it you might think it's the global you know assessment tool you might think it's this piece of training it's all of this put together but in a priority fashion and it's about making sure that the positiveness again of our force is taken advantage of and we turn that positiveness in, into increased readiness for the future so I'll stop there and, uh, and I'll pass it over to my colleagues Thanks, uh, General Romberg. <clears throat> so I'm going to invoke the executive privilege of the podium and go out uh, slightly out of the order that you see in front of you it's to, as an object lesson in the uh, resilience and agility of the panel. Uh, I'm going to jump over General Horaho um, uh, only uh, to further emphasize the, uh, the importance uh, that has already been demonstrated by the Vice and uh, General Bromberg of the line leadership and command in uh, overseeing these programs and turn, uh, turn the podium over to uh, Lieutenant General Mike Ferreter, who is uh, the Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management. And I was trying to count the number of CGs within IMCON. I think you're the fourth. Is that correct? I think I'm the seventh. But seventh? Okay. I could be Henry the eighth before we were done. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. Thank you very much. Well, it's a great day to be a soldier and uh, an Army family member a DA civilian and a, a retiree in the room here and it's a especially great day to be here with you at AUSA. And it's a great day to show you what we at Installation Management Command and in the AXIM are doing to make soldiers and civilians and families ready and resilient. And, you know Army installations uh, are platforms for readiness and resilience and our team and, and, and they are the platform where about uh, one-third of the soldiers assigned there live on post and so army communities are also platforms outside the fence line as we say for our soldiers and our families and our team at uh, AXIM and MCOM are really masters at both the art and the science of installation management and Command Sergeant Major Earl Rice and I truly are privileged to, uh, to watch and marvel at what our people do at the garrison level who are on the, at the point of the spear, really, in helping the Army team stay Army strong. Installation Management Command helps synchronize with the senior commanders. And so there are garrison staffs across the Army, and they work for the commanding general at that installation in order to deliver the Ready Resilient programs and all installation services. And so those great teams partner. Uh, across the board with Medi MedCom and a medical treatment facility that's on site and me members from NETCOM and often the garrison commanders say I'm having a meeting with my dot coms because all of the programs and the authorities and the responsibilities that we as teammates uh, send towards them are synchronized and integrated at the garrison level to take care of people. Now as we looked at this we're, we're sort of at the execution or delivery of the programs and so as we looked at this we thought you know one thing about 75 installations around the Army um, is that if you can come up with the way to do it the best practice and consistent, consistently deliver it then you can do a couple things one you can create certainty for our families and our soldiers around the Army because they know it will be there for them you also can save lots and lots of money through what otherwise would be wasteful or, uh, or you know, just variables in any equation. We organized uh, what, at what the, some of the key programs for Ready and Resilient. As we talked about this for, for several months, 
Uh, and we just finally scooped them up and said, let's make it understandable for company commanders and first sergeants because they are the ones we are serving. Their soldiers and families are the ones that we are serving, and they have to be able to know where to get that service. And this applies to the active component and to the reserve component. I'm going to speak more, more specifically to the active component. If you put the slide up. This is what we call the, the cloud slide, and you'll see that in the center of it is, is the uh, Army branding. And so that could be an individual soldier in the center. That could be an Army family. That could be a Department of Army civilian. That could be our employees, and that could be a unit. And it could be the whole Army as far as we're concerned at, at this level. If you're old enough to know what the face of a clock looks like, many of you youngsters think it's digital. Well, at the top is a 12. And so from 12 to 3, you're seeing the programs that, that we use to, to have an unblinking eye as we move soldiers around the Army and through their career. So sponsorship, female to female sponsorship, uh, families with uh, sports uh, youngsters coming in, and then soldiers. In fact, soldiers are not permitted to receive PCS orders now until uh, they have a sponsor at the gaining location. And then you have SHARP, you have First Sergeant's Barracks Program, and, and, uh, and so this, this means that a soldier and a family arrive and they are received and integrated into our program, in, into the Army, into that unit by the unit commander. As you go around the clock from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock, this is what we call sort of the Army Strong. And there you'll see Master Fitness Trainers, Master Resiliency Training, and you'll see Conference of Soldier and Family Fitness. And then you'll see things like our intramurals and in, uh, an Army Sports Program and that's the commanding generals of, uh, to include uh, General Cohn and, and General Allen have asked. Army training is actually a part of this because soldiers who train um, have higher self-esteem. Good training makes good soldiers. And then you see strong bonds and the BOSS program. So, so th those are the programs when integrated that create s stronger soldiers. And doing just simple math, if there's some 500,000 active component soldiers, and there's about 20,000 maybe in the integrated disability. That means we probably have about 480 soldiers that are, are ready for Army Strong and to keep being built ready. From 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock, those are our special, special programs and special people, ranging from the Gold Star families and, and our fallen warriors, um, our child development centers, and our exceptional family member programs. And you can see embedded health on there as well uh, on the... Uh, up at about 2 o'clock. So these aren't MCOM programs. These are Army programs <coughs> organized and delivered at the installation. And then finally, from about 9 o'clock to, to midnight is, is, uh, are those programs of Army continuing education, transition, jobs, hiring fairs to take care of our soldiers as we move on. And then again, the, the Army program, Soldier for Life, that we can speak a little bit more. Now, we have some problems in the Army. Uh, we're going to accentuate the positive, but we don't always know where the problem starts. And so for 12 years, we've all learned that you fight a complex problem in a network with a network. And so is the substance abuse a problem because of deployments? Is it because of family problems? Is it, be is it something else? So is, is suicide because of deployments? Is it because of substance abuse? So uh, these programs in concert uh, are, are designed to, uh, to deliver the services and to help our soldiers uh, or to build our soldiers strong and really create that ready and resilient force. And if we get the programs right and the delivery right, then the senior commanders, the brigade commanders, the battalion commanders can take their soldiers uh, and their family members to where they know um, that they're going to be taken care of. And that's what we're all about. Thank you. Thank you, General uh, Ferder. Our next panelist is the 43rd Army Surgeon General and Commander of the U.S. Army's Medical Command, a career nurse corps officer and a clinical trauma nurse specialist who parenthetically was uh, at the Pentagon uh, triaging and treating patients uh, uh, on 9-11 during the attack on the Pentagon. Uh, General Horaho has uh, commanded at uh, every level from community hospital. She was the uh, commander of what we now call a Walter Reed Classic when it was uh, in the district. And um, 
has commanded uh, regional medical command, and I'm, I was privileged to have her as my deputy surgeon general uh, uh, while I was a surgeon general. She replaced her predecessor's uh, bowl of uh, Hershey nuggets with uh, carrot sticks, uh, for which I'm still uh, recovering. Uh, and, and we'll hear from Patty Horho. Patty. Thanks, Eric. Afternoon, everybody. As we look through um, the partnership lens with the medical community and what readiness and resiliency means, there's four points that I'd like to make. And so the first one is that we're really, when you talk about readiness and resilience, it's looking at ensuring that we've got systems in place that brings health to where our soldiers are. And so part of what we've been doing is nesting what we're doing in the medical community to what actually is occurring across our Army so that this is not a medical plan, it's actually an Army plan. And we're all focused on improving the readiness and the resilience of our soldiers and their family members. And so it's standing up soldier-centered medical homes, which is um, in the footprint of where our soldiers get their primary care. It's looking at standing up our Army wellness centers that are attached then as kind of a touch point um, to our patient-centered medical homes where we've embedded uh, behavior health in our, our patient-centered medical homes and kind of synchronizing wellness and care and alternative medicine, medicine skill sets. It's also looking at embedded behavior health where we put that and place that in our brigade combat teams as well as physical therapists so that we reduce injury and prevention and, and really improve health outcomes. And it's, it's, it's really looking at standardizing the processes and capabilities and the programs that we have out there so that they're well synchronized on the ground, they're synchronized at the operational level, and then from a leadership level across all of our forums here that we're synchronizing our policies, our programs, and our resources so that we focus on improving readiness and resiliency. The, the second point that I'd like to make is it really is meeting people where they need to be met. And so it's the synchronization of those programs and their capabilities. And it's making sure that we don't wait for people to come to us, that we try to do that outreach so that we're being much more preventive and much more on the wellness aspect of it. And I think this is the huge culture shift. Uh, I think the entire Army is taking this serious as we look at the culture shift and moving towards prevention and wellness. And as um, General Bromberg kind of mentioned, you know, we went through an era where we had tremendous amount of fiscal resources that were given to us at a time of 12 years of war. And what we did at the fast pace that we were going is we developed those programs for every type of um, issue that arose or something that we were trying to solve. And then what we found is that we have a tremendous number of programs that are out there and it's very hard, I think, for our family members and our civilians and our, and our um, soldiers to be able to navigate that. So part of what we're trying to accomplish with readiness and resiliency is how do we make sure that we're supporting the programs that give us the outcome capabilities that we want that really lead to an improved readiness of our force, improved readiness of our families, and then also increase in, in wellness. And so as we're looking at this from the medical lens, what we did is we nested our performance triad into the readiness and resilient campaign plan. And our performance triad is the focus on sleep, activity, and nutrition, and also brain health. And, and success for us is that no one will look at that as a medical capability. They'll look at it as embedded in the DNA of our Army, that our line leaders own sleep and that they really focus on improving the sleep of their force, that we improve nutrition, we, we have a more active force and more active family members, and I believe then we can improve the health, we can bend that, the cost curve, and we'll be able to use each of those areas that I talked about, soldier-centered medical home, our wellness centers, our patient-centered medical homes, and then all of our subspecialty and specialty care as a continuum of care that really pushes health and wellness outside the bricks and mortar into the life space where our patients are. So I look forward to the questions and the discussions. Thank you. Thanks, General Horho. Um, we're really privileged to have on the panel today uh, an established uh, scholar and academic in the field of resilience. Um, Dr. Karen Rivich. Uh, she's the co-director of the Penn Resiliency Project and uh, a research associate at the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania, working with Dr. Marty, working and publishing with Dr. Marty Seligman. Um, she's an accomplished uh, scholar and uh, author of uh, numerous publications, uh, uh, both books and uh, in journals, on uh, children and adolescents' uh, resilience. 
uh, and works uh, in coaching and uh, providing consultation to uh, organizations of all sizes and uh, in all sectors on the themes of resilience and optimism and strength development. And we're really pleased to have Dr. Rivich here today to talk about the science and the evidence basis uh, for building resilience and this, no this notion that this is can be an acquired attribute, an acquired trait, and uh, eager to hear your comments, Karen. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here. I'm part of a research team at the University of Pennsylvania where our focus is on understanding what are the building blocks of resilience, and then once you know that, how do you train resilience? The bottom line is this, resilience is teachable. There are a lot of myths in our culture about what resilience is. For example, many people believe it's an all or none trait, that it's a trait that's just for the lucky few. But what we know from the science is that all of us can enhance our resilience by building the competencies that enable resilience. So I'd like to review with you what are the building blocks of resilience. Well, there are six, at least six, that we know of from the science. The first is self-awareness, the ability to track your thoughts your emotions, your reactions, and then to do a quick assessment. How are they working for me? Are they working for me or are they working against me? The second is self-regulation. Being able to regulate your impulses, to change your thoughts, emotions, and reactions so that you are productive in any given situation. The third building block of resilience is called mental agility. And that's being able to get outside old patterns or habits of thinking that are bogging you down and to see a situation flexibly and accurately. The fourth competency that enables resilience is optimism. And by optimism, I'm talking about the brand of optimism that's wed to reality. So I'm not talking about denying that bad things happen. They do. But optimism is a thinking style that enables people to believe and see the good in a situation and to focus their energies where they have control rather than squandering their energy on elements of a situation that they can't do anything about. The fifth uh, competency in resilience is called strengths of character. And it's not enough in resilience to fix weakness. If we fix all of our weaknesses, what we are is not weak. Resilience is about being strong. And so another element of resilience is knowing who you are at your very best. What are your top character strengths? Whether that be forgiveness or bravery or spirituality, curiosity. It doesn't matter what your top character strengths are, but what matters is that you know who you are at your best and you grow that aspect of yourself and leverage your strengths fully to overcome adversity, to grow, to thrive. The last building block of resilience or competency is connection. We know that other people matter. One of the myths of resilience is that resilient people go it alone, and that's wrong. Resilient people reach out to others. And so another way to build resilience is to make sure that you're building and maintaining strong relationships personally and professionally. Now there's been a lot of research in each of those competencies that show why they matter. I'll just briefly describe optimism. As a recovering pessimist, I'd like to give a shout out to optimism when I can. <laughs> there have been hundreds of studies on optimism, the ability to think about the good, to focus your energies on what you can control. And what we know from the science is that optimistic thinkers have greater mental health. They're less depressed, they're less anxious, they have greater life satisfaction, greater well-being. They're also physically more robust. When an optimist gets sick, he or she recovers more quickly than the pessimist. Studies show that optimists live longer than pessimists. Optimism also has bottom line effects on your performance. So there have been studies in sports, in academics, in the workplace, all of which show that when you're under stress, when you're under the gun, pessimistic thinkers tend to underachieve, optimistic thinkers tend to overachieve. Now, for the past 20 plus years, our team at Penn, led by Dr. Marty Seligman, has been developing 
resilience training programs. These programs have been used in a variety of settings, schools, universities, organizations. And the purpose of these, quite importantly, are not, these are not treatment programs. These are prevention programs where the goal is to equip all people with the skills to thrive. Let me give you a flavor of what we teach in these resilience programs. So we teach people how to challenge counterproductive thoughts that are pulling them off their A game and to increase their optimism. We teach people how to enhance their problem solving by being more accurate and thorough about what's causing problems and then helping them to find solutions. We teach people how to hunt the good stuff. The bad stuff will find you. So part of resilience is noticing the everyday good things that happen in our lives and then reflecting on what that means to you. We also teach people how to increase purposeful action by controlling that catastrophic thinking that some of us fall into at times where our brains become a runaway train and we get into a downward spiral of doom and gloom. We also teach how to strengthen relationships. Part of that is when there's something difficult that needs to be said, how to say it in a way that increases the likelihood the problem will be solved, but just as important, perhaps more important, it tells the other person that you care about them and that you're gonna work towards a win-win. On the flip side, when someone has a positive experience and wants to share it with you, we teach people how to respond in a way that increases trust, belonging, a sense of connection in the relationship, and multiplies the joy or happiness for both people. Now, there have been over 20 controlled studies of the resilience programs. They've been done in a number of settings uh, at Penn and, ar and around the world with various age groups. And here's what we tend to find with these resilience skills. When a person learns these skills and we track them for one, two, three, or more years, we see that they are more robust. They're less likely to get depressed when bad things happen. They're less likely to become anxious. Their hopelessness decreases and hopefulness is built. They report greater optimism, greater satisfaction in life, greater overall well-being. It's important to point out that resilient skills are sticky skills. And what I mean by that is that they're not a quick fix. That when you use these skills of resilience, what we find is that because they lead to positive outcomes in your life, in your relationships, in your readiness, you're going to be more likely to use that skill again in the future. The, still, the skill is stuck to you. I want to also just comment briefly on the Army's initiative around resilience. To my knowledge, this is the biggest resilience initiative that's been ever undertaken. And I, I feel very strongly that the Army is leading the way in helping us to understand how you create a culture around resilience. From my vantage point, what the Army is doing is elevating psychological fitness to the same level as physical fitness. The Army is rebranding what it means to ask for help. That asking for help is seen as a sign of resilience, not a sign of weakness. And importantly, that resilience is known as the bedrock of what enables readiness. Thank you. Thank you very much. A fascinating discussion. And, and if I might uh, just add a foot stomp to this uh, notion of uh, of optimism and hopelessness, let me just give you a quick vignette from my own experience with this. And it, it derives from working with uh, Lieutenant General Mike Tucker there and Roy Cooper, Dr. Roy Cooper, a shout out to Roy uh, from Pittsburgh, who has been so instrumental in helping our most grievously wounded uh, soldiers, Marines, airmen, and sailors. Um, we observed that uh, our amputees were among the most resilient and uh, a group of, uh, of our uh, wounded soldiers uh, that we cared for in, in Army and military medicine. And uh, one of the things that seemed to be uh, a feature of that, and, and I traveled with um, an aide, uh, uh, then Major, now Lieutenant Colonel Dave Roselle, who was one of the first amputees below the knee of the Iraq Wars and then redeployed twice uh, to combat thereafter. 
Um, in, in observing this, this population, what I was struck by, and we had some uh, actual demographics to describe this, uh, this was among the most optimistic and hopeful population, in part assisted by the medical and their own line community who reminded them that they could literally and figuratively be put back on their feet. And as a consequence, we saw them zipping through the recovery uh, almost faster and with uh, l less problems than uh, many others, um, uh, 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 other counterparts. And so I, I, um, I applaud your efforts to uh, build that notion of, hope, of, uh, of optimism and a closely linked attribute of, of, of hopefulness. Finally, the batting cleanup is uh, uh, Mr. Greg Zoroya, um, a career uh, journalist, uh, uh, currently writing for USA Today. He has been writing a special um, a feature for USA Today since 2005 aimed at the impacts of these wars on our soldiers and families. Um, uh, we've all admired and been appreciative uh, uh, in an odd sort of way for uh, his ability to put on the front pages of uh, USA Today in, in full view of the public uh, the travails of our, of our families and our soldiers and reminding the public uh, that we are still at war and facing some uh, daunting challenges. And uh, Greg, we're very uh, pleased to have you here today and uh, looking forward to your comments. Thanks, Eric, and uh, thanks for those really generous remarks. This is a strange place for a reporter to be. I'm normally on out the, out there on that side of the day, so uh, <laughs> bear with me. But they asked me to speak about uh, external perceptions of uh, readiness and resiliency or, or kind of how the public views. And I'm not a, uh, the world's greatest authority on the public, but you do get a sense as a reporter trying to get a sense of what they want to read, what they click on on your web page and so on, what they're interested in. And talking with people in the public and those in the military, you get some sense of that. From kind of, I think, the broad 30,000 foot level when it comes to the military doing something and accomplishing something, um, especially in this era when there is such skepticism about big government and whether a government can do what it's supposed to do. I think surveys have shown increasingly or, you know, steadfastly that the, that the military, above all, continues to have a lot of, people have a lot of confidence that the military can do its mission. And I think uh, that, that's, gone, that's gone on for quite some time. There's also, along with that, I think, after all these years of war, a continuing deep <laughs> reservoir of affection for those in the military. I think the public still uh, looks at soldiers <coughs> with great fondness. Uh, just, uh, I was just given a list by the Pentagon a couple of hours ago. I was, I was looking at this whole issue of the Fisher House stepping forward to assist with the death gratuities that went away. And I was, I was given a list by the Pentagon of at least a dozen other corporations and private groups that had done exactly the same thing and offered to help out. So I mean, there's a lot of evidence out there of this continuing affection. Um, but I also think that, that uh, there's, um, there was this, this issue of, of kind of a complicated um, Concerned that the that um, the people don't really understand the separateness between, or they don't understand the military in many ways. There's kind of an inherent separateness between the public and the military. They don't understand some of the functions. I think this is um, uh, one reason why, for example, uh, they don't understand why if someone has, for example, a behavioral health problem or a substance abuse problem, and they want to get counseling at, a, at an army base. Uh, with some exceptions, their commander is notified that they're going to get, get this counseling. Or, or the fact that in this latest uh, tremendous amount of publicity about sexual assault, they don't understand why if somebody has, a, has been assaulted, that at some point a commander, effectively a, a boss, is, is notified and is, is involved in the process of trying to decide whether, for example, charges can be brought forward and, and there's going to be a, there's going to be a prosecution. I think. This isn't to suggest a judgment that one way is right and one way is wrong, but I think it, it goes to the heart of the fact that the public often doesn't understand things like um, a chain of command or, or uh, this notion that commanders must, uh, uh, you know, have, have responsibility for good order and discipline. And, uh, and you can argue either way, but the bottom line is that it's two different cultures, and so when, when the military does things like that, often there can be confusion. Uh, on the part of the public. When it comes, I think, specifically to this notion of readiness and resiliency, you also see a kind of a conflict and a complexity, I think, to the public's view. 
um, I think they really view those through two separate lenses. Um, for the concept of readiness, I think the public absolutely thinks the military is ready or that soldiers are ready. I think they're, this, is, this is reinforced by our culture, our popular culture. American children today are weaned on these, these incredibly finely tuned battle games that uh, and first person player games where they see these uh, very cool professionals uh, being highly competent and they, and they spend hours trying to do and be the same thing. Adults see the same kind of an image of this kind of professional soldier in popular culture. They see it in, uh, in the movies that they go and watch in the theater, Zero Dark Thirty or, or the rescue of Sea Captain uh, Richard Phillips. Uh, it, they, they read about it in the, in the news with the killing of Osama bin Laden and the raids more recently in North Africa and so on. So I think there's, there's this image of when it comes to readiness that the soldiers are absolutely ready, but I think if you talk about resiliency, which suggests some kind of a, uh, of a more internal issue, uh, invisible wounds if you want to talk about it, it's a different lens entirely. I think that they, uh, they see a, a lack of resiliency, and, it, and it, it, it's in conflict with the other image, but I think it's out there. I think if they think about them in that, in those, in that context, uh, and, and really saying a lack of resiliency really isn't, I don't think, what a lot of people comes to mind. I mean, not that per se. It's more because a lack of resiliency sounds like a failure of some sort. I think it's more um, that uh, they, they have been damaged, or at least a certain number of them have been damaged, by virtue of being involved in, in a war in which you know, the public's very aware of these back-to-back -back rotations, uh, that have, have caused them to serve in combat probably longer than any other any other soldier in, in America's hi in America's history, and and I think this they can they can identify with that because it's it's in the context of, of wars that the public itself is very wary of, um, and so you have this kind of stereotype of the of the um, uh, of this kind of damaged person. Tragically, it is also reinforced by popular culture, not just in the kind of the age-old stereotype of the Rambo person, but in the headlines where you have the Navy Yard shooting. Uh, people don't read the details or, or go to the heart of the details that the person involved there wasn't even in, in combat or had deployed overseas. I don't think that makes any difference. It's still the veteran suddenly doing something terrible. And of course, the record numbers of suicides that they read about, um, the whole issue of the struggle to uh, assist uh, uh, veterans, and, and, and I think the public's view, and this, this isn't fair certainly, but I think they see all these institutions, the VA, the military, kind of as one, because they all deal with, with the soldier, both as an active duty soldier and later as a veteran. Um, uh, they, they see this as a, and they, when they read about the failure to uh, provide adequate compensation in a timely fashion or to see somebody uh, for therapy in a timely, in a timely way. Uh, again, the focus is on this person who is in trouble and needs help. So I think um, when it comes to the public perception, these are really two different uh, concepts. They see you as very ready in one light, uh, but they see, uh, they see resiliency as a problem uh, in another. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Mrs. Roy. I mean, this is a remarkable achievement here as a, as a moderator. We were we challenged the group to uh, spend no more than five to seven minutes on uh, their areas, and uh, sure enough, we've got one academic, one journalist, and four general officers all to stay within a five to seven minute time frame, which I, I think is the first in my. They must not. They must not pay general officers by the word as they did when I was in active duty. Um, I've got three uh, cards up here, and I really encourage everybody out there who has uh, any questions or observations, uh, uh, comments, or concerns to, to uh, write those out and uh, send them forward. I see a lot of, of folks out there that I know have a lot of experience and a lot of responsibility in these areas, and I'm looking forward to your questions. The first question I'm going to direct to uh, uh, General Bromberg, uh, um, RG1. And uh, th we talk about the functional link between these programs uh, and uh, what we're looking for as an army, which is readiness. And I'd like you to comment, if you might, about what the link is between resiliency and individual readiness. Okay, thanks, Eric. So I take you back to the average 18 to 24-year-old in America and start with national readiness. So as we know, about only less than three out of every 10 18 to 24 year olds really can qualify to come in the military. 
So you start off with that population. And over the last several years, what we've been doing uh, through the G1 with the help of USREC is we've been looking at those who come to the Army with GEDs, non-high school graduates. And as you know, we take soldiers with GEDs now. But we've also given them a type of, I'll say for lack of a better term, a personality type test. And those that score high on that test with that GED get through basic training at a higher rate than a lot of our high school graduates do. They get through their first unit of assignment with much lower attrition. And they, they continue to complete their first term of service at a much higher rate than some other folks do. And when you look at the personality test, if you will, it looks at those things of those people who've gotten through with adversity in their life. And some people say, well, maybe this person got a GED because they didn't graduate high school the first time and they were homeless or they had to go out and work or there's a family crisis or something. And they learned how to overcome that. They went back and got their GED at night and they joined the military and they get through all the little hiccups of basic training and their first military experience. So you can use that anecdotally, but I think that's a piece of readiness because we certainly don't put people in basic training and recruit them to want to throw them out at the end of basic training or after, before their first three years of service. So I think that's the first building, very simple building block of readiness. So conceptually, what you want to do is then identify people who maybe have some challenges and start training them in basic training to start building resiliency even before they get out of the training pipeline. And then expand that as they go through the first year of service. And even put it into ROTC and other places, West Point and other places, because not everybody has different life skills, but you got to start with that foundational piece. And, as you, and you don't know what everybody's product was when they came home. That's the first piece of readiness. The second piece, I think, is if you take a squad of 10 soldiers, and if only seven of them are ready, if you could, rep if you could prevent two of the other three from not being ready, whether it be a physical injury, teaching them how to overcome that and being that optimist and how to get back in the pool versus running on the track and figure out swimming or something could do something for you and overcome it, working with the programs on the post or whether it's a, a personal issue and removing the behavioral health stigma piece. And you can return two of those people back to that formation. What a tremendous tangible thing that a company commander could touch. And I think our company commanders now, while they maybe understand that, if, you, if you've always had more than you're authorized, it's easier not to do all that extra work ahead of time. And we're not going to be in that environment. And I think that that's how we'll make us stronger. And I think that's this whole life cycle piece that we talked about, the vice mentioned, is about the readiness piece over time. Because what you want everybody to do is emulate the fact that how strong people are to begin with and how much stronger we make them. And then when they leave the service, they will also help us with the strategic piece of recruiting more people. I was pretty good when I came in, or I wasn't pretty good, but look what the Army did for me, and you need to go in the Army. So that's strategic readiness from the other side as well. And just, I, I think, when you look at this whole thing together, that's how we have to sell it all the way from the basic training, pre-commissioning, pre-entry stage, all the way through the completion of someone's career. Um, we all, again, we all enter with different skill sets, and there's many, many things. But when you really start digging in resiliency, we know that rifle marksmanship scores go up after people have undergone resiliency training over time because they don't get frustrated, they're more in control, they're more optimistic, they understand their weaknesses, those kind of things. It's all very easy for us to say. It's very hard to do, and I challenge even us up here or anybody out there, we probably aren't, you know, we definitely don't understand all our weaknesses all the time. But how do you, you can't overcome those until you understand what those are. So from rifle marksmanship to PT scores to to working together as a team, all those things are the intangibles that make great units even greater. And if you go back to examples of prisoners of war in Korea, World War II, and other places, ask how well organizations, and some of it's by country, how well groups of POWs survived during different conflicts through individual leadership, or maybe you could say some level of resiliency ability to overcome adversity. So I think all that together ties into many, many different levels of readiness, but we have to start at the very, very beginning pre-entry. Hey, let me just add one thing, because I think it may have passed very quickly what Howard said up front. Because if you think that this is an Army problem, then you're not looking at it the way we just talked about. And this is a national problem. So if only 3 out of 10, and it's really less than 3 out of 10, it's about 23 percent of the people in the United States today can serve in any branch of our service. 23 percent. Think about that. 
So if we're taking the best and brightest, those are the same 23% that universities are vying for, big business is vying for. If we're taking that 23% that has the mental and the physical capacity to join that service, and yet we're still continuing to have these challenges. Think about the rest of society and what's going on out there. Okay. So again, this is uh, <coughs> these challenges that we have, and we'll continue to work on them. And every soldier is very important. But 23%. Raise your right hand. And the difference is we ask these young soldiers, men and women that come in, to do something, to join a profession larger than themselves, but to do something no other profession has to do. Maybe firefighters, maybe police officers, but no other profession orders people to put themselves in harm's way, knowing that they may take their own, that they may have to put their life on the line. Think about that in combat. Thanks, uh, <clears throat> General Bromberg, the vice. Um, the next question is for, uh, and, and uh, I'm encouraged, I have a large number of uh, questions now coming in from social media. I'm told that if you have a, a question in the audience and are not reluctant to use the microphones, feel free to use the microphones. Uh, otherwise, uh, just write them on a piece of paper and raise your hand and we'll have one of the staff come around and get that. Um, the next question is for uh, General Farrader. And, and this really could be answered uh, because I'm seeing questions for really almost every one of the members of the panel. But this is directed at General Farrader, but General Horaho, you have a similar one, um, uh, General Bromberg. In an era of decreasing budgets, what is your biggest challenge in delivering these resiliency programs? What, we've, what we did last year and, <clears throat> and the year before um, was recognize that we were going to we were going to be short. Uh, the resources and so the, so and uh, as we looked at how we delivered the in services on ev all the garrisons or installations uh, we knew that uh, it's a natural thing for people to go quickly and protect their equities and and move apart and and uh, we uh, we didn't see we chose to see it as an opportunity vice uh, uh, an unsolvable problem and so we 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 immediately established a series of first we called them rock drills and then we changed it to call CPX and a command post exercise. It may be the size of the donuts. One makes it a rock drill and the other makes it, you know, a CPX, a different child. But we changed the name, but we didn't change the method to get with those commanders that we support. And so we we have gone to Forces Command and Army Material Command and Training and Doctrine Command and USER and USER PAC and met with the senior generals who pulled in their senior generals, their, their commanders of installation, with the garrison command teams. And then we took on each of the concerns and put them in the priority that because so many, because every installation is unique. And it can be because of geography, it can be because of the type of units there, it can be because of uh, the, the state of the, of the, um, the infrastructure. So working together, we then were able to prioritize how we were going to take these on. And so in some cases, that permitted us uh, to use soldier power in places and then shift the money to, uh, to the family program to protect and ensure the family program uh, came on. It also immediately, as, as, this, if, as we sit here today and, and discuss this, it's the culture shift of commanders, command sergeant majors of the soldiers involved in the delivery. And we, we all went through a period where it was so busy, uh, you'd come back from a deployment, you'd, you'd get ready, you know, see your family real quick, and you're pushed out to the field, and then you deployed again. And so in this case, um, it, it then began to teach uh, the leaders of the Army, you know, you're going to decide where, why, and how this is going to get delivered, these things, and you're going to be involved. The best example that I can cite is the First Sergeant Barracks Program. From about 2007 to uh, last year, uh, we had Army civilians running our barracks. And so if we had Army civilians running the barracks, that was a good thing to account for chairs and beds and windows and assign rooms and, uh, and get our utilization up. Well, we shifted the paradigm because over time we were losing control of the barracks. And so now you're having maybe on an entire floor, the third deck, 
There's only one female, and she's bound on both sides by six rooms in both directions, and, the, and above her and below her. And that night, someone's knocking on the door saying, hey, hey, Special Jones, hey, Sergeant Smith, you know, what's going on tonight? And so we had put them in a place where we had, we had lost governance. And this is where these things like sexual harassment and sexual assault uh, could be derived. And so the leadership of the Army said, together, everyone accomplishes more. Let's get the NCOs back in the barracks and, and uh, provide the professional assistance in accounting for things in the barracks, but get them back in unit sets. The squad, platoon, company, battalions are now living closer together. The natural chain of command and support structure was there. And, and this is the way we're taking on part of things like sharp and, and sexual assault in the barracks. Thanks very much, General Farrader. Uh, General Horho, you had almost exactly the same question, but especially as directed toward the embedded behavioral health teams and patient-centered medical home, and I, I guess I would rephrase it. Do you have a program budget through the fight up for these programs, and, and uh, how, how robust are they going to be supported? Okay. First of all, Eric, you have to have a budget. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and Congress must approve your budget, and you can't have it continuous continuing resolutions so Patty doesn't have a budget yet and uh, we need people to continue to talk about that let, let me add to Mike and I'll let Patty answer this question because it is very tough and all of our senior leaders have to make these very tough decisions and what we try to do is provide sort of decision points for our senior leadership Secretary McHugh and General Odierno and we try not to make a decision in a vacuum to where because of the physical environment we live in that we would have to make a decision now that we wouldn't make that same decision if we had a friggin budget all right and it moves to the right so we have to we have to play with that and work with that we deal in prioritization and in risk all right and we have to make some very very tough decisions there and then we have to let the senior civilian leadership understand what those priorities are and then what that risk is and uh, I really do believe that the leaders at this table, uh, the leaders out in the field, our non-commissioned officers, uh, have the candor uh, to provide that feedback to the, to the senior leadership. But the hardest piece of this is the uncertainty. All right? We're good at planning. We're good at making decisions. But the uncertainty that we have to plan with, and we have been planning with for the last several years, is dysfunctional. And we're not being good stewards of resources, and we have to do better. Our nation deserves us to be better, all right? Because bottom line, when our nation calls us to go do something, they don't care about sequestration. They don't care if you've had resiliency training. We have to provide an army that's ready to win our nation's war. So it's very, very tough working these prioritizations. But Mike and Patty and Howard do this very well. And every post camper station's not going to be the same. But candidly, over the last 12 years, we've kind of grown a culture of entitlement, all right? And we've been able to do that because we've had all this money. And we've had the good grace of Congress to provide us additional resources. So if we had a program that we needed, we can go out and buy it. We can get it. We can't afford that now. So we can't afford to be redundant. And we have to take the right resources and make sure we get the biggest bang for our buck at all of our post-cancer stations, take care of our soldiers and our families and our civilians. And in some cases, we're going to get that wrong. And we're going to have to back up, take a look at it, and move from there. And so it's going to be very tough as we move forward. But we all deal on prioritization, and the chief and the secretary set those priorities for us. And then what we owe our senior leadership is what's that risk? What's the risk to the health of the force? What is the risk to the mission? Uh, one of the takeaways I'm, I'm getting from you, Vice, and, and it's, a, I think, a very uh, cogent reminder that just as the business community and the markets complained about the lack of predictability that uh, the government shutdown and the problems with the budget did for them. Those who advocate for our army and our military need to be reminded that they need to advocate for predictability for us, that nobody can plan without predictability. Yeah, thanks. Patty? As, um, <coughs> as we've seen the rising cost of health care, we've also seen a decrease in um, improved health. And so when the vice talked about, you know, less than 25 percent, are eligible today, our national security risk is that we're not getting healthier as a nation. So when we look at the constrained budget, one of the things that we're really focusing in Army Medicine is not cutting programs, but rather changing that uh, paradigm and investing in those programs and those capabilities that we know are going to improve the health outcomes 
of our soldiers and their family members. So we're investing readily in embedded behavior health because by seeing embedded behavior health in that habitual relationship, we've seen improved health outcomes. We've seen oh, almost 23,000 decrease in inpatient behavior health bed days over this last year because more people, and we've doubled the amount of behavior health appointments, almost up to 2 million appointments. So we have an increased access to care because of decreasing that stigma with putting physical therapy in the units. We've actually decreased the orthopedic injuries from our new recruits in AIT. And, and so we're really looking in where do we invest so that we can improve those health outcomes. And the other piece that we're readily investing in are these wellness centers that focus on health, health assessment, tobacco cessation, as well as um, alternative medicine so we decrease the reliance on our health care system. So if we don't invest in the right things, we will constantly have an increasing um, medical bill, excuse me, medical bill, and we won't have a healthy population. So that's, that's the paradigm shift that we're looking at. Can I interject uh, just one quick <coughs> question? Absolutely. It just, I'm just curious about the sequestration, if that goes forward. And I know that a big part of the Congress wants that to stay in. And talking to Senator General Horaho before, she, she discussed some of the hits they took there. What will that do to this program? I'm wondering if that goes through next year, knowing what you knew from last year. So if I could, I, I think this comes back to uh, prioritization. Just, I mean, this is what we have to do. If this is about game-changing for the Army, then it has to be prioritized and funded over other events. And I think back to the, one of the other questions, uh, not just to Grace Con, but also about what do you think one of the biggest challenges concerning the budget. It's our own uh, inability to think through the problem, and I'll use maybe a resilience term, pessimism versus optimism. Because we can sit here and wring our hands when the budgets do get released, because this program took cut, but we're going to have to make hard decisions. And if this is going to be the program, we're going to fund it. And that's the leadership's intent. And I'm glad you brought that up, Greg, because we are, we are going to fund this program at the expense of other programs. And I think that's what our, our audience or our service members haven't seen us have to do before uh, because they've, uh, we've been able to give them anything. And I'll use strong bonds as an example. So when you ask how we do strong bonds, so all you know is strong bonds. If you don't know, strong bonds is the relationship training that chaplains do. And everybody loves strong bonds. But if you try to do some analysis to say who gets strong bonds, it's everybody. Versus what about focusing our strong bonds on couples that are at risk to build their individual resiliency and to improve their family readiness so they can be more productive. So we'll have to change and prioritize. So maybe it's something you can't give to everybody, but those are decisions we have to make. But I think that's our biggest challenge is internal pessimism versus in internal external optimism that we're going to get a budget, whatever it is, and we're going to have to figure out what to do with it. So Howard, can I infer from that? One of the questions is, is Oh, I took care of three questions. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you get credit for four. Yeah. <laughs> is that November 4th, date for the stand-up of the resiliency directorate a hard date? Yes, it's done. It's done. It is done. It's just, we're just changing the letterhead. Can you, can you give us a one or two sentence executive summary of what the responsibilities for that directorate will be? Yeah, the, the, uh, the responsibility of the directorate will be to the synchronizer and the driver and energy from the department level for making resiliency the cultural change across the Army. Good. Thank you. You know, Eric, if I could also, Please. another example, because it goes to the question that I was asked earlier. Um, so Strong Bonds, wonderful program, really needed by uh, our soldiers and, and, uh, and married couples. And when we had lots of money, you know, we would go to a four-star location, you know, with big swimming pool and, and uh, even, you know, the cost to get them there costs a lot of money. The delivery can also be, you know, go from Fort Lee to Fort Eustis get them away from the problem, stay in privatized Army Lodge in there, pour the money back into the installation, uh, and then have one, two, or three different delivery uh, modules for strong bonds. We've changed all of that as a result in, in this last year to focus on the soldier and the outcome, vice the method of delivery and the input, and, and uh, it looks wow and special. And so m much of these programs are being defined as the best way now to do it in a time when there's, uh, when you got to 
consider that you're paying for it. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, I'm going to address the next question to uh, Dr. Rivich. Uh, I, I was really struck by these six building blocks. In fact, I wrote them down. Self-awareness, self-regulation, mental agility, optimism, strength of character, and connection. Um, one of the things I was fascinated by in your own bio is that you are the mother of now 16-year-old twins and, and a 12-year-old boy and a, and a 9-year-old girl. So you have kind of a little fire team of your own. <laughs> and uh, uh, as parents of a 15-year-old boy at home, our, our Sal's Audrey, my wife and I are struck by the similarities between our teenagers and young soldiers who have this problem of self-regulation and the lack of a prefrontal cortex. Uh, <laughs> can, can you help us a little bit in this resiliency? I mean, the very same features that lead a soldier to jump out of a perfectly good airplane at night under fire and take risks uh, leads to dysfunctional behavior as well. Can you give us a little insight into how the program can address the problems of self-regulation. Yeah. I mean, so there's a few interesting, I think, facts that are important. I mean, one, there does seem to be um, an increase in depression in youth. So it, it, it used to be the data would suggest that the modal age of onset, the most common time someone would have their first episode of depression, was about mid-30s. Data now is showing that by the time children graduate high school, 20% will have already experienced a first episode of depression. And we know that the younger you are um, when you have your first episode of depression, the more likely it is to be recurrent. So we know that there, and, and depression comes with uh, anxiety, substance use and abuse, um, all sorts of issues that relate to self-regulation. The skills that we uh, teach in this program, and s sometimes these skills kind of get a bad rep because they're from the field of psychology and, and people think of it as sort of touchy-feely. But really what we're talking about in, in these resilience programs are critical thinking skills. We're talking about skills that enable someone to, as they're ha having a thought that's leading them to become angry or increases their anxiety, to be able to stop that chain of thought and change their thinking midstream. That's, that's a deep self-regulation skill. And we know that by about age 10, kids are able to do this metacognition, to think about their thinking and develop the ability to change a perception, to change their thought, which drives emotions and reactions. And so what we find in our work is that when we start with kids early enough, um, late childhood, middle school, that by learning these self-regulation skills, they're not only doing better in the classroom, but they're half as likely to experience depression. Now it begs the question, why are kids more likely to be depressed now than they were a few decades ago? And, and this is just conjecture, but I think struggle and failure has gotten, have gotten a bad rap in our culture right now, <coughs> that we overprotect, and that the skills of resilience are natural skills that we all develop in time. The more you protect children from failure, you rescue them every time they struggle, you're depriving them of the opportunity to learn to regulate and therefore programs like this become more and more necessary. Yeah, do you have a residential program up in Pennsylvania for <laughs> us uh, parents? Of yeah, it's my home, 20 Sabine <laughs> Avenue. Yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for that explanation. I'm, I'm going to turn the next question. It was originally directed at General Horho, but I really think, uh, and Patty, I, I welcome your comments, but I want to direct it at, um, at Mr. Zaroya. And it has to do with how the Army and the military can overcome this persistent stigma uh, of PTSD and seeking mental health treatment. I know that's been a subject of many of your columns over the years. What, what, what advice do you have for us or thoughts? You know, I, I think uh, just from my experience in working with, uh, I'm particularly intrigued by those at the, at the, at the real where the rubber meets the road level. Uh, they uh, enlisted and so on, and, and it just seems as if there you've got a real you know, permanent conflict going on. I mean, the military is so caught up in, with the idea of, of of being ready, of being the best, and particularly for those who want to strive to 
to reach you know those areas of, of uh, training and, and skill that uh, where they can really excel. This notion of stepping forward, obviously, and, and suggesting there's something wrong is just a, it just goes completely against the grain. But what really seems to to work is is kind of from my experience is are, are those and I know this is uh, I think a key area that you're focusing on is, is this whole leadership leadership issue particularly at the small unit level I think where you have commanders uh, you know staff sergeants um, first sergeants and so on who not only know their people but are are, are willing to you know uh, notice when something's wrong and and then reassure that they can seek help and then guide them to do so um, it seems like you can't. You're really not going to be able to accomplish anything unless you get that kind of that kind of cultural change there, where they're willing to to look at it, and accept it, and and uh, and infuse it within their within the ranks of their of their of their fire team or their or their you know their squad or their platoon and so on. That's where that's where people know each other and where they live and and, and sleep and, and get hurt and get, and get killed together is, is at that level and and uh, and and where you have, where the leadership really can can make a difference. It seems to me. I mean. Because you know, everyone knows that once you begin to, once you address these issues, as, qu as soon as you do, the better chance they have of, of, of not developing something even more egregious and, 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 and become even sicker. And uh, so that's, that's where, and, and they, they respect their squad leader, they respect their team leader, and, and if that person is willing to, to, you know, tell them to take a knee and, and talk to somebody about it, it seems like you'd have your greatest success. Um, at that point in time. Uh, uh, just to follow on to that quickly, I know and uh, General Ham was commended for his willingness to come out and be very outspoken about his own struggles with PTSD and I think now Lieutenant General retired Frito Fridovich and with his uh, addiction to, to narcotics and pain struggles, uh, even uh, uh, Command Sergeant Major Bob Gallagher who whose face was on the Army uh, times and AUSA for so many years uh, coming forward with the problems that he struggled with. D do you see those um, as as models that are that influence the public uh, to include our public, our, our soldiers, or um, are are those of us who are self-revealing um, kind of kidding ourselves? Let, now, I, I mean, let me give I'm you another sorry. one, Greg, before you answer that, because I just yeah. talked about it at lunch, and that's. Staff Sergeant Ty Carter, Medal of Honor recipient from just a couple weeks ago, and he's en route, may already be in the building, but I talked about it and showed a quick video at lunch today with the Sergeant Majors, and he says in that video really that his platoon sergeant saved his life because he understood that Ty was having <coughs> an issue, he understood the behavioral health resources at Fort Carson, and he understood that saying you need help was a sign of strength, and so he got Ty to go get the right care. And so uh, Staff Sergeant Carter, again, very valorous. And if a guy like him can reach out and say, hey, there's something wrong, I need the help, then that ought to be for all of our soldiers that ought to be able to get out there and do that. But it's the non-commissioned officers that have to take this on, that have to understand that, have to lead that culture change for us. And uh, Sergeant Carter is really going to be a, a spokesman, really, uh, in his own way to help us realize that and really get that word out. For great, great. Patty, I mean, you, your community is one that sees the sometimes the end result of not addressing these things in a timely way. Have you any thoughts that you have about how we can overcome this stigma? I, I think we've um, it's it's normalizing it and and saying that when you have experiences, there's going to be some type of reaction, and we need to be able to seek behavioral health and seek it early. And so part of what we've been trying to do is push behavior health through telebehavior health in Afghanistan so that it gets out to some of the most remote areas so that when someone has an experience instead of waiting the cumulative effects until they redeploy back they're able to talk to someone at that point it's looking at five different touch points and so from our youngest private to our generals of making it mandatory that people go through their behavior health and have it embedded in primary care so that instead of seeking behavior health it's just part of their health care and, and part of their health um, routine. I think those things are very, very important. And uh, the other piece of it is, is, is I think leaders have to feel comfortable having those frank discussions and, and, and sharing experiences. And we've seen that in the past with camaraderie from World War II or Vietnam and the, and the groups that stayed together and talked about shared experiences and kind of worked through and normalized it. 
that's, that's behavioral health, but it's done through the buddy system. And so I think we need to look at it through other lenses than just the medical community, but we look at it from a shared experience with our, our military community. Dr. Rivas, is, is stigma hardwired into our brains? Is it, is it part of the neuroscience that we are burdened by, or is it purely a social uh, phenomenon? I don't know the answer. Um, I certainly know that there are so many cultural misconceptions that reinforce stigma. So from a perspective of resilience, a very deep cultural misconception is that you, you either have it or you don't. And that we fail to understand that resilience is a, something that you have to tend to, that even the most resilient individual will at times need to replenish that resource. You have to make time to rejuvenate. And if we think of resilience as something that you have it or you don't, when you start to struggle, you think of yourself as flawed or damaged, which makes asking for help harder. If we help to really educate people that resilience requires tending to, just like your physical health or your physical health, then I think we can start to decrease that stigma associated with taking care of yourself. Yeah, I'm, I'm struck by the mindfulness literature that talks about the fact that we spend most of our thoughts in the past or the future, both of which are fictitious actually, and, and part of the, the catastrophizing is not seeking help. Maybe some of the skills we're teaching through these resiliency <coughs> programs will help break down that catastrophizing. Um, I, think it's, I think we break down the catastrophizing. I think really fundamentally what these resilience programs do is, is reinforce that resilience is a team sport that this is not something that resides in an individual alone. It resides in an individual, in a culture, in a community, in a squad. And the more we think about it that way, then there's no shame in reaching out to your battle buddy yeah. because it's a team sport. Yeah, great. Um, Vice, I, I, both for you and General Bromberg, I have a question here. Um, under, under one of your predecessors, um, and a lot of effort was, was uh, devoted to the Army's program on health promotion, risk reduction, suicide prevention actually started as suicide prevention and then risk reduction and, and, who, and health promotion. Uh, can you tell us how this, the readiness, the ready and resilient uh, campaign is a successor to or different from or building upon that earlier um, uh, task force and, and uh, report? Yeah, thanks, Rick. I think we're trying to build upon uh, what we've learned. And so really the suicide piece is uh, underneath the rubric of Ready and Resilient is one piece of it. We think that is pretty comprehensive that as you look at the health of a soldier, family member, or civilian, that you've got to take a holistic look at it. And you just can't look at suicides and some of the issues that somebody may have and the stressors that they face um, could have been helped with potentially resiliency training or could have been helped with alcohol and drug abuse classes or could have been helped with strong bonds or could have been helped with a battle buddy. So we've learned a great deal about suicides. It's, you know, there is no, as you know, silver bullet out there that says uh, this is the key. And it's very frustrating for the military to deal with that because it's not part of our DNA. And when we have an issue or problem, we want to go out and fix it and get after it. And we have not been able to fix suicides. The numbers for us this year uh, on the active side have gone down, so we're seeing a positive trend. Hopefully we can continue that. On the National Guard and on the Reserve side, that number has continued to go up. And it's much, much harder for a National Guard and Reserve because of the geographical dispersion, the resources that are available. Um, so we're going to have to continue to work at that a little bit harder. But I think we're taking what we've learned, trying to uh, expand on that and uh, keep working at it, but also to look at it in a positive light because, as Howard talked about earlier, everything as we take a look at it is in a negative light. And we were going to these meetings and we were looking at uh, suicides and trying to dissect them and learn everything we could, but a lot of the data was a year old and we were looking at old cases. And when I started looking, I said, what, what are we doing here? We're, we're looking at trends, but if you were to say, uh, what are the trends? I think all of our soldiers would point out the same things we've learned over the last couple of years, financial issues, relationship issues, alcohol issues, those type of things. There's not one thing. It's a very, very complex problem. And again, not just an Army problem. It's a national problem that our nation has to take on. Uh, but I think we're going to learn from those, continue to build upon that. And I think under this Ready and Resilience campaign and building upon resiliency that we'll start seeing some of those results. And We've got some very good uh, programs and master resiliency training that's going on out there. Uh, and our goal is to have one 
per company, one master resilient trained personnel per company. We're trying to work that into the families, and I think uh, we're starting to see, as Karen talked a little bit about, some of those results that come out of having soldiers, family members, and civilians have gone through that resiliency training. So uh, I think uh, on a positive side, we're all pretty excited as we continue to move forward there. Great. You know, I was, I was struck uh, w w just as and sort of analogous to the, uh, our agonies over why people left the Army back when captains were leaving uh, in droves. Uh, many of us said, why don't we ask the people who stayed why they stayed, not just why people left. And, and, and this, by the same token, we spent a lot of time talking about why people suicide, but we have terrific stories about people who are successful in preventing suicides. And uh, so capturing successes, I think, and, and promulgating those, I think, are almost as important as, uh, as wringing our hands over the, over the suicides that occur. Uh, Howard, have you any thoughts about how you're going to know whether the Ready and Resilience campaign is, is working and what differences you're looking for there in terms of metrics? I think just, I think just like the risk reduction campaign, which put us in that fact-finding stage, that at that time we, were, we believe we were in the solution-finding stage, and I think we did find some small victories, but it was more fact-finding. I think with the resiliency campaign, I think as we move forward, we'll know when we're there when we start seeing, the, as I said, the total force readiness. It'll be all the indicators across the force. I mean, look at everything from domestic abuse to the stressors on the force to, to domestic abuse, alcohol rates, uh, not just suicides. It'll be a combination of all that. And at the end of the day, I think we'll see families and soldiers that are, that are definitely at a higher level, level of readiness and more positive attributes across the force. I think that's when we're going to know we have success. As we said before, we're always going to be ready to do things because uh, that's, that's who we are as an Army. We'll never give that up. But it's, it's how we do that over time, I think, is the real thing. I think we're going to learn more. We're going to go out this first year as we, as we get in this next phase of the campaign, and then we'll learn a little more, and we'll learn a little more, and we'll learn a little more, because this is a long-term effort. Great. I think we've got a question here at the microphone. Maybe you could identify yourself, if you don't mind. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Cadet Christopher Leggy from Norwich University. Um, I just want to say thank you very much for taking your time. I know it's an important subject. Uh, my question for today is a second lieutenant or a new second lieutenant coming up in May that hasn't had the experience of you know having a traumatic event or any experience such as deployment or any type of issue like that. How is myself and other future leaders be able to deal with those situations going to a new unit, and would this be possibly be applied? when I go to the basic officer's leader's course. I'll start it, Mike, if you want to continue. Yes, First, thanks for the question and standing up there to ask that great question. And uh, what we're really trying to do in all of our PME, all of our professional military education, from our sergeants to our lieutenants from West Point to ROTC, is re really get resilience into that part of our instruction. So we're working that very hard and we'll continue to work on that. You're going to have great non-commissioned officers after you go through the basic course that uh, you need to latch on to and they're going to want to take you as a lieutenant uh, just like they did with all of us as we grew up and said uh, here's what right looks like and uh, this is what you need to know because they know that you're going to make some decisions that will impact the soldiers uh, in the platoon, the company with them. So um, you're not going to do this thing alone and uh, we're going to make sure that we provide you the training, the education and then you're going to get that experience because you're going to hang around with platoon sergeants and squad leaders that have that experience, have seen some of those things, um, especially in combat as well, that can make a difference and they're going to help you get along because they know that's part of their job uh, to make you successful. Uh, I'll start with a question. Would you like to trade jobs for the next year? <laughs> no, sir. All right. Okay. We got that going for us. And, and as well, you, those who are going to develop you are going to be developed and, and, uh, and we've put together a course for all the battalion commanders and brigade commanders to understand how these programs come together and so then they train their company commanders who develop you and so as you as you get out of your basic course and graduate from ranger school <laughs> then you, when you arrive then then you'll be ready um, and, your, and your commander will know and the first sergeant will know and then guess what you'll have 36 young uh, soldiers who you'll carry on your shoulders in terms of taking care of them knowing that these programs are out there and thanks for asking an awesome question. I'll, I'll just add that you're already more successful than you even realize. 
graduating from college, going in the Army, becoming a second lieutenant today, you're already at the top of your peer group in this country. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much.